Hey there, I'm Jackie Ferris. This week, color textured images come to life at the Delaware Contemporaries exhibit Fields and Formations. Get ready to expand your mind. The 302 is just a brushstroke away. Welcome to the Delaware Contemporary. We're joined by Kristen Heilman, who is the curator in residence for fields and formations. And you're gonna love this. It's colorful, it's bright, it has all kinds of texture and collaboration. There's just so much going on with the show, Kristen. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we tried to um, create a picture of some of the abstract work that's being made in the region between Philadelphia and Washington, D.C focusing on women and non-binary artists. And the result is just a, a show full of amazing materials and bright color and exploration of, you know, minute little form to really big explosive gesture. So there's a lot to see here. Now, when looking at your description online, it says that there's a lot of emotion and there's a lot of uh, metaphysical elements to this show in over 70 pieces. Is yes, that that's right? right? That's right. 12 artists, over 70 uh, pieces total. And yeah, I, I do think these are artists who, I mean, so we think of abstraction as just you know, maybe just color and shape and not really telling any type of a story. But I think when you spend time with these pieces and you see some, in some instances the meditative way that they've been put together, like the piece behind us, it's just a study of color that's so concentrated and focused and meticulous. I mean, that puts the artist in kind of a contemplative, emotional, a metaphysical state, if you will. So there's a lot of motion and spirituality throughout this work. So let's talk about the piece that's just right behind us. It really is gorgeous. And at first sight, you look at it and it seems like a series of circles, but you can tell there's a lot of depth to it. That's right. So this piece is by Lin Ling Lu, who is based in Baltimore. She's a Chinese American artist. And you have um, an oval formed out of individual circular paintings. Now, what Lin Ling does is she first spends time on the computer digitally composing the color compositions that she wants. Then she goes into her studio and it's an amazing studio to be in because it just sings with color. So in her studio, she mixes paints. Um, in other words, what I'm saying is she's not able to use the paint straight out of the tube. She goes into the art of mixing it to get these very subtle colors that resonate off one another when they're put into concentric circles like you see here. And so in this case, she not only made that series of paintings, but then she grouped the paintings in a way that adds more energy between the color combinations. You really can see that uh, she's got to, gone to great lengths to, you know, uh, change things up and really give each circle a different feel. Yeah, they feel very individual and yet they sit together in a kind of harmony, which I think we could say is, you know, one of the themes of the show. There's lots of sort of different parts, but even amongst all the artists, there's sort of a like a balance or an, a harmony that comes out amongst the works. There's also a transformative sense. Um, in one of the pieces in the corner, it's all about, it's made out of yoga mats. Yes, yes, so that's Alex Epstein, another Baltimore artist. And what Alex does is she takes yoga mats and is very consciously, you know, referencing the idea of these mats being a tool by which uh, people, often women, try to improve themselves and strive towards certain goals of beauty and physique. And she's um, then cutting them and using those rather than paint as the material of her painted compositions, which, you know, I think both look at at the sort of um, aspiration to make, improve ourselves and go to the gym and make ourselves better. But at the same time, there is this undercurrent of recognizing that there's a lot of consumption involved when we do that. We buy the yoga mats, we buy the exercise outfits, and um, sometimes we over 
We make overly complex something that should be a more simple process. You know, you mentioned the process of mixing the paint, um, but I can imagine that, you know, cutting the different yoga mats must have really, you know, they put a, a sense of themselves into each piece. I think you're absolutely right. That's very well stated. Now, there are two artists that these artists draw their inspiration from, and I wanted to talk about the piece on the back wall. It, right. It's very, it mirrors a lot of uh, the feel of Alma Thomas right. and what she did with what looked like mosaics. Can you talk a little bit about those two artists and how they factor into all of this? Absolutely. So, as I said, this show is really focused on women and non-binary artists because even today, um, artists, diverse artists, women artists, don't necessarily get the attention they deserve. And the two artists you've mentioned, Alma Thomas and Ann Truitt, were artists who worked in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, even slightly before and slightly after. But their heyday was, was in the six, uh, excuse me, 70s and 80s. And they never, I mean, they were known in their lifetime, but I don't think they really were celebrated in the way that they should have been based on the amazing work that they produced. And in fact, there were other artists based in DC, male artists who probably we could say got more attention than they, they did. But just to be sort of brief about it, uh, both Alma Thomas and Ann Truitt really focused in on shape and color in their work. But they brought the sense of joy, a sense of emotion, a sense of um, contemplation and meditation to the work as well. And so, you know, an artist like Carol Brown Goldberg, which is the artist that you're mentioning in the back of this gallery, uh, she certainly is aware of those artists' uh, work and inspired by those artists in her own work, which is also an exploration of you know, color and shape and how it can be used as a jumping up off point for us to kind of think more deeply about our own feelings and experiences. Now, um, Anne Truitt, she did a lot of columns with different colors. So she had the color and she had the shape. Precisely, yes. She, so Alma Thomas was a painter and exactly, Anne Truitt was a sculptor who, who really honed in on these columnar forms which she painted by hand in various colors. So we're going to explore um, more forms when we return. I'm Madeline, I'm with Winter Tour, I'm the Natural Lands Technician here. Uh, get back to nature with the 302. Welcome back, we are at the Delaware Contemporary and we have moved further into the galleries for fields and formations. I'm joined by Kristen Heilman. Now Kristen, let's talk a little bit about, we're in this second room and it's like a color explosion. The deeper, it's like a color explosion. The deeper you go, the more you see, the more detail and the more color, especially when you talk about what we have behind us. I mean, they're like vessels, you know, with a splash of color. Yeah, absolutely. So the work behind us is by Alexis Granwell, who is based in Philadelphia. And I think people can recognize that the bases are made out of cement and wood, but it becomes a little bit more like a, a question mark when you look at the top and um, are trying to figure out to figure out what those are made from. And in actuality, what it is is sculpted paper. So, you know, think about um, paper mache, right? Before it hardens, that kind of um, very manipulable, um, almost liquid paper. Well, that's what Alexis uses to form these. And she's mixing in pigment to give it coloration. And in some cases, she's also mixed in um, pieces of fabric that give it uh, different kinds of color. It really is interesting to look at and when you, and you wonder, wonder to yourself, you know, what is she trying to, you know, express? What kind of emotion is she trying to bring out or experience for the, the person? I guess it's interpretive, you know, it is what you think it is, right? Yeah, exa exactly. I mean, I think all this work really lends itself to personal interpretation. Um, but, you know, in the, Alexis's case, she has beautiful titles. They're kind of poetic. One of these pieces is called Full Bloom. Um, another piece is called Deluge. You know, so the, the, the titles themselves, I think, point to the kind of movement that we perceive in the pieces. Um, things like water, flowers, and things that have a delicate color as well, so. 
I think that's in the work. I wanted to talk about the one piece that just jumps out at me is the one that's on the far wall. That's It's kind of a collaboration right. um, between the artist and the folks here at the museum, right? Yeah, exactly. So the piece you're talking about is called Wrenching News, and it's by the artist Marin Hassinger, who was based in Baltimore for decades. She taught at um, the Maryland Institute College of Art when she, was, when she made this piece, although she's now based in New York. And what you're seeing on the wall is a disc that is comprised of about 400 pieces of newspaper. So really, I should say 400, uh, 400 bundles of newspaper with each bundle of newspaper containing 10 strips of newspaper. So we're really looking at 4,000 pieces of newspaper that have been twisted um, to create this very, well, I think for Marin, she would say it's like a mandala type shape. So. You know, what Marin has done, and she works with the staff of the institutions where this piece is realized as well as volunteers. So there's a whole core of people here in Wilmington who helped make this piece. So what, what happens is that people tear the newspaper into strips and then in this very meditative way, they twist the newspaper. And on a metaphorical level, I think we can consider this as taking all the trauma and tragedy and ups and downs of um, news stories, in this case, stories printed in the New York Times over the last year, and kind of communally working through them, processing them and integrating them into um, something that is very, literally is holistic and that speaks to um, common labor coming together to, you know, to make a whole. And the title itself just is so fitting. And I think it's something that um, no matter what you think of the news, you look at the piece and you're like, I get it. Right. I get it because it has been rough, you know, what we've all been going through. Um, next to it, there is um, very precise ink and paper. That's graph paper, right? Precisely. So those works are by Lynn Myers, who uh, lives in Washington, D.C., and in fact is a native Washingtonian. Um, and what Lynn does is, again, in a very meditative, focused process, she transforms simple sheets of graph paper, you know, just the kind that we all worked on when we were kids, into this sort of spatial and um, these spatial compositions made from tiny little lines or dots that when they are put together in dense ways or more spread out ways really make the paper seem like it's undulating or that it recedes in space parts come out at us um, so i think it's you know they're just beautiful studies of how the simple gesture of putting line on paper can you know create an incredible image and I, I would think that if when someone comes to check out this exhibit that it's really the kind of thing that you have to sit with and you have to like look at something, you know, from different angles because while there's a lot going on, there's so much texture and you, you could miss something because while something may seem simple, it's complex. Yeah, I mean, I love that notion that um, when you get drawn into work that you actually stand in front of it for a while and really spend time with it, you know, both looking at the whole image and then trying maybe to understand how it was made and yeah. gaining some appreciation for, you know, the work that the artist put into making something very beautiful. Yeah, there is a, a painting just behind you, which t tells that story completely because you look at it and you think to yourself, this is layers of paint and there's, you know, other materials on the canvas. And so you, you, you really appreciate the time it takes to make something that, you know, people, it's like looking at clouds, everybody sees something different. Right, right. And that's the beautiful thing about abstraction is that, you know, when you spend time with it, it reveals different things to you. So the work behind uh, me is by Maggie Michael, another Washington DC artist, and Maggie, um, you know, she's very active with her paint. I think you can see that, you know, she applies it not just with a brush, but sometimes she pours it onto the canvas. And she's also collecting things in her own travels, like a little bit of dirt from a special place that she's visited or some little debris from the area where her partner's studio is. And this gets mixed in with the paint. So you get a very, like when you look at it, you get a very textured surface that also has this personal meanings to the artist. And I think, you know, we can then take an, our own journeys after looking at this piece and think about places where we've been, where, you know, like the beach where the sand sure. is so tactile. Um, so 
but that material has meaning is really um, part of Maggie's work. Excellent. And we're going to talk more about fields and formations when we return. Rebecca, I'm a zookeeper here at the Brandy Wine Zoo, and I love the lemurs here on the 302. Welcome back. We're at the Delaware Contemporary talking about fields and formations. Now, Kristen, this is one of the pieces that I think people are really going to remember when they come for a visit. It looks like macrame. There are so many different things you could interpret um, this piece, but tell us a little bit more about it. Sure, sure. So this is a stunning piece, and it's by Jesse Herod, who is a, a Philadelphia-based artist. And Jesse is referring to macrame, so you're right there. Um, and they are also using paracord, which is um, kind of, it's often brightly colored, strong cord that you use for sporting and outdoor activities. And one, one could say that that cord kind of has more of a masculine association. And Jesse, I think, is really playing with the gendering of the material and the uh, technique of macrame and building this fantastical form, which when I know that when we were all looking at it together a few minutes ago, uh, we were discussing like how it could fit onto our bodies as if it was some kind of garment or costume. And I, th I think again, that's something that Jesse would really welcome the sense that in their work, uh, viewers are perceiving something that's very related to the human body. Now, in talking about, um, I guess, the gender roles of some of the materials, we're also looking at pieces that talk about um, the various cultures of the artist. Um, this piece right here in front of us being one of them. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so we're looking at work by Joe Schnell, who is based in Baltimore and has been for several decades, but grew up and spent her um, early adulthood in South Africa. So Jo, um, jo really combines in her work both references to the South African culture from which she comes and um, sort of traditions of Western painting in which she's immersed. And very specifically in these works that um, comes out in shapes that she's taken from Matisse's compositions and textiles, literally the fabric um, that she brings back to the United States um, after visits from visits to Africa. And so in the painting that we're looking at, um, you see uh, fragments of fabric that sort of strike out a grid and then these interesting shapes that um, in a way almost become narrative, they almost become human-like. Uh, the piece itself, which is, a, is comprised of a big painting and then three smaller paintings, uh, is called Gob of Gladness. And in talking to Jo about this work, uh, and I don't think she would mind my sharing it with you, she sees it as a work about pregnancy. So there's lots of ways you can kind of read that into the abstraction. It seems that there could be a reclining figure in the middle of the painting. The big painting has a bulge in it, sort of where the canvas is built up. And then of course there's this th these three baby paintings that accompany it. So it's a very, I think, joyful and exuberant um, work, whether you understand that reference or not. It makes you wonder what's underneath the big bulge in the canvas. But you of, can't touch. You can't <laughs> touch it. That's one of the things that we were talking about before is that I always want to touch these things and you, of course you can't do that. But uh, in talking about the different textures that make you want to touch a canvas, um, the artists on the back wall, really beautiful colors, a lot of texture. Um, on canvas and a lot of uh, another case where cultures have been combined. Yeah, that's right. That's Natessa Amon and she's a Philadelphia artist. Natessa was born in Pennsylvania and in fact is influenced by Pennsylvania Dutch uh, quilts and textiles, but she's of Indian heritage and um, some of her family spent time working and living in Africa. So these three sort of textile cultures come together in Natessa's paintings. Unlike um, Jo, she's not literally putting fabrics into most of her paintings, but you see pattern and repetition and colors that might evoke fabrics that we could find in India or in Africa or um, here in, uh, in our region in Pennsylvania. 
And this is a, a case where, you know, depending on the light, the subject is vastly different because she uses um, like a, I don't want to say glitter because I'm yeah. sure that's not what it is, <laughs> but um, a, a, like a metallic um, paint and substances as she layers. So if you get close, you can really see the sheen move with the light. It's really cool. Yeah. So this is what we were talking earlier about how you have to sort of stand in front of a work of art, spend some time of it with it, get closer and farther apart and even move side to side. And with Natessa's work, you'll discover what you, you've observed that she mixes in things like little pieces of mica and other things that catch the light in different ways. So in some patches of her, her work, you see kind of glittering surfaces and other areas you see matte surfaces. Sometimes the paint is really thickly built up and she kind of inscribes into it. So that's very tactile too. And she also, also does this very interesting thing. So most artists, when they create a painting, the first step is to put gesso on the surface. And that gesso is usually a white paint um, onto which then you paint your imagery. And uh, one of the works that Natessa has, she had used black paint as her gesso. And so that gives a kind of, a, just a different background, a foreground relationship to the, to the painting, I think is really interesting. So it's beautiful imagery, but technically there's a lot of thought going into how to make it. And you should spend a lot of time to just kind of explore it. So if someone wants to come and check out Fields and Formations, tell me a little bit about how they can do that. Sure. So the show is here at uh, the Delaware Contemporary, which is open Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from noon to 5 p.m. Um, and, you know, there's social distancing measures in place, so it's a very safe environment to come and spend time with the work. And the show will be up through the end of this year. So there's plenty of time to make your way here. Well, Kristen, thank you so much for spending time with us and just kind of helping us to explore all of this. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for visiting. We'll be right back. For more information, visit decontemporary.org. That'll do it for this episode of The 302. We're going to leave you now with some beauty shots on the Riverwalk. Until next time, I'm Jackie Ferris. Tell them you saw it on The 302.